and then there's usually a little load, what we call floating load. It's stuff like twigs and leaves and, and junk on the top that's floating along. And even though that might sometimes look like a lot of stuff, it is minuscule compared to the dissolved load, the suspended load, and what's going on with saltation. Suspended load by far carries most of the material. So when I look at what's going on down here uh, with um, the uh, normal uh, rolling and saltation, I call that bed load, because that's happening right at the bed. Suspended load is the stuff that keeps staying stirred up. Dissolved load is the chemical ions that are floating along, and the float on top, which is pretty nice. Okay, so the portion of the stream sediment load that consists of tiny solid grains carried along with the water, but bouncing off the stream bed, is the stream's water. bouncing off the stream bed. This isn't suspended. This is a step beyond. Oh, but not bouncing off. Oh, I'm sorry, you're right, but not bouncing off. Okay. So you're right. It's got to stay stirred up to be suspended. If it's bouncing along on the bottom, then it's saltation. And there's, you know, just kind of a fine line between the two as the energy level just picks up enough to take that saltation load and keep it, keep it in the water column. Okay, good. So this brings up two, more, two terms that you need to do. One is the stream's capacity. And this is simply the total volume of sediment that the stream can carry. Okay? And this tends to be a function of discharge. Competence, on the other hand, is the maximum size of a fragment that the stream can move along. Okay, so one, capacity is total volume, competence is size. And now, competence tends to be controlled more by velocity. So they give you some inklings as to what's going on in that stream. Here's an, an example of competency. You can see the kids standing here by these big boulders for scale. This is Olson Creek back in 1983. Olson Creek's just a crummy little creek. I mean, it's like three feet wide. It, it's about maybe half a foot at the most deep. Now, how did it move material this size? Well, there's a flash flood. It got bigger, deeper, fast. But the important thing was that water came rushing down as a torrent. <coughs> Velocity was way up. So it didn't take as much water discharge-wise, but it took moving what water you had and moving it fast. So, and how do I know that really occurred? Well, these are sitting on top of patches of grass that were there at the side of the creek before the event. So it was pretty well documented. So pretty amazing uh, how a stream can be totally innocuous one minute and the next the moving pieces like this. So capacity refers to the stream's ability to carry large sized materials. Is that true? Pass 
Complexity is the total amount of material the stream is carrying. Competency is the size it can carry. Okay, so two terms ought to be familiar. is a transitional step between movement by bed load and complete sediment suspension. Suspension increase the energy level just a little bit, and saltation now becomes suspension. <coughs> Excuse me. So, yeah, this is the transitional step between pure traction load and the bottom of, of, of uh, bed load and moving into suspension. This is kind of the way we get there. So, yeah. Okay. When we're looking at this meandering river system with its cut bank and its point bar, and there's another type of river system that's pretty common, and it's what we call a braided stream. And it just kind of looks like what it sounds like. Somebody took somebody's hair and braided it, twisted it together. And you can just see all these different channels that just kind of snake their way back and forth with sandy, gravelly islands out, you know, pods out in the middle of the, the stream. And you can see here an infrared picture up in Alaska, how here's a braided system where the channel is pretty poorly defined. It's cutting in and out, doing little channels across the floodplain. It's got all these little gravel islands in it. It's trying to carry a lot of material, and it just can't carry it. Now, it used to be that we thought that the controlling factor here was the amount of sediment that was available to the stream. <coughs> the stream simply had way more sediment than it had energy to carry along. So it continued with dropping it, picking it up here, dropping it there, and it was kind of moving along in a uh, kind of a jerky fashion. But what we've kind of come to realize is the real reason it's doing this is it depends on the material type. If it's clays and things that hold together pretty well, there's kind of a threshold to, that it takes to break that clay apart and to entrain it into the, into the water, into the river. So it isn't readily available. It, it takes some extra energy to actually uh, break it up and entrain it. Whereas if I have sands and gravels, it doesn't take much of that stuff to just fall apart. It, off it goes. If there's energy there, the river will take it. So it's not that the stream has too much material to carry, it's just that there's too much available to the stream. <coughs> I know that's a fine, slightly fine point, but uh, that there is a difference there. So uh, that's what we, what we see. And um, you might notice that um, streams kind of have different patterns to them. Between braided streams and um, meandering streams, that's pretty obvious. But if you look at a map, and other than those two kind of big end members, braided streams and meandering streams, if I were to just pick up a map of around here, I'd see that there was a pattern that the streams formed. If I picked up a map, up in Canada, there'd be another pattern. Now, what's controlling these different patterns? Well, 
one thing that we see is just this dendritic pattern. And that's simply saying everything's about the same. There's no big one single controlling factor. One way is as good as another. So it just takes this random branching pattern as it collects the water. Or if I see this radial pattern, where everything kind of looks like it's coming around a point and moving out from that point. Well, that's a good sign that you're probably dealing with some kind of a high, a hill of some sort. And in many cases where it's a significant hill, you immediately kind of think in terms of a volcano. You have to kind of know the context of the area. But that's a first cut sign. Just look at the drainage patterns, this radial spoke pattern. Or what if instead the radial spoke pattern was all going inward toward a lake? There wouldn't be any good drainage out of the lake. It would just be a low that was accumulating water, but it was all kind of moving in toward that low. Still radial drainage, but in this case it's a low, it's not a high, so the drainage is inward instead of out. Another type of pattern is what we call a rectangular pattern. And here we get rivers that are kind of straight segments, and they take these right hand bends, or some angle, but usually they're fairly, fairly right hand. And right away, you know something's <coughs> wrong here. Mother Nature does not go in straight lines. So you know there's got to be some bedrock joint control here. And the streams just plucking out the fractured rock along the joint because that's the stuff that's already broken up. It's the easiest place to go. And it's just, in this case, you've got a joint pattern that's 90 degrees to each other, and it's just following its way along as it goes downhill. Or we get a pattern that we call the trellis pattern. And you can kind of see, it looks like a grapevine. Uh, here would be the main branch coming up out of the ground. And then here are the vines trellised onto the fence, spread out along the row for harvesting. And this is typical when we see some folding, and we have anticlines and synclines. Synclines become the pathways for the trellises. And now you've got to ask yourself, Look at this main trunk. How does it cut across these anticlines? I get the part running down the valley in the synclines, but how does it cut across these ups and downs? Well, a couple ways can happen. One, you can have drainage from the drainage divide going to one drainage divide this way and one drainage divide the other way. And as the heads meet, they simply continue to erode through the anticline until one stream becomes dominant and that captures it. Or you might have a case of antecedent streams. Antecedent, it came before. In other words, it was flat land there. There was a stream. And then the area started to undergo compression, and an anticline began to buckle up. But the stream was there. And that stream, as the anticline kind of buckled up underneath it, the stream went, wait, 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 wait a minute. I'm, I'm great. I'm happy here. I'm going to keep my grade. You can do all the buckling you want, but I'm going to keep cutting down. I'm going to stay graded. And that stream is just going to do that. And despite the growth in the fold, the stream continues to cut down and maintain its grade. So it's just a matter of being there first. So there are a couple ways it can do it. But whenever you see this type of a pattern, you immediately go, aha, folds, synclines, anticlines, and the grain of the folds is going along with the trellis. So just looking at the stream pattern on a map can tell you a lot about the structure at depth tell you what went on in the area. It's pretty cool. Okay, so drainage patterns usually reflect the nature of the subsurface geology and give us a first hint as to what's below.
seconds. <coughs> Absolutely true. You got Just a kind of cheap and cheerful cook way of doing it. empties out into the basin. This is where the water is redistributed after being collected in the tributary system at the head of the stream, transported through this transport segment down to the basin at base level. Now we've got to get that water back out into that basin. And obviously we can just have one river, just one thread shooting water out into the, into the basin. But that's not very efficient. And we've collected all that water, that really kind of backed things up upstream if that was our only outlet. So what the stream tends to do, and remember by the time we're out to this basin, we're pretty flat level. Things aren't moving very fast because it's graded and that's the part of the grade that's pretty much flattened out. So it's slow. And if we relied on that one thread of slow water to empty the system, everything else would be backed up and back up. So what it does is it forms a series of channels to redistribute the water out into the basin. This is the distributary system. And it kind of looks like the tributary system only at a much smaller scale. And here we can see a system where we're dumping the sediment that's coming the stream down through the hills. You can just see the different streams as it distributes the water and the sediment out across the, fan, the uh, floor of the basin, leaving this fan that kind of has an apex back here at the, the head of the, the stream. Notice here they build a road, and the road comes out around the edge of the fan. How often do you think they have to rebuild that road? Millions of times. Millions of times. <laughs> I'm going to start deducting points. <laughs> <laughs> so you've got this, what we call an alluvial fan. It's fan-shaped, so a good part of the name. And it's alluvium, which is simply sediment laid down by water. So this alluvial fan now is growing out into the valley. So what would happen if instead of a dry valley, it was a basin filled with water? I'd still be making an alluvial fan, only now it's a delta. And now there's a little more interaction going on with the water out of the basin. And it's changing the shape of this fan uh, depending on what's going on out in the basin. For instance, uh, if I look at uh, this delta system over here, that would be the delta system coming down from Bangladesh. Here, when it dumps the sediment and the water into the Indian Ocean, there's a very strong tide. And the tide, of course, moves onshore and offshore back and forth a couple times a day. And as the sediment is dumped out there, it is remobilized by the tide and it's carried along and you can see a whole series of islands that are being formed as the sediment dumps out there and then it's being reshaped by the tidal process. And you can see how they're kind of parallel and elongate to the direction of the tide. So we call these tidal deltas. Or how about over at this end of the scale uh, we see what we call a wave dominated delta. That would be typical of the Nile Delta coming out of Egypt. There's the Nile moving north into the Mediterranean. It's splitting into distributaries. They're dumping sediment out along the front of the fan. And there's a strong